Yo. So anyway, as you can see, we've got the observation hive rocking its ass off here. I've put a little bit of a cover on it. <laughs> Very high tech bit of a towel going on. And anyway, we'll, we'll film that, taking it off in a minute and I'll show you some shit. I was just watching some of the comments on this bloody Bush B-Man YouTube shit that you guys post, which is awesome. And apparently I'm compared to Bob Rob, Ross, which is a dude that used to paint these cool paintings. And it was wet on wet painting style or something cool like that. Anyway, he seemed like a really cool dude. By the way, I have no artistic talent whatsoever, so I thought I'd make a hive and the girls can paint their own picture for you. How good would that be? <laughs> anyway, we'll get this crap off of here. That's just to keep the draft out. So if you actually have an observation hive in your shed or in your kitchen or wherever, <laughs> If you leave the glass exposed, the ladies will, um, not only will they get cold, unless you have a double layered glass hive. What is that called? What's that called when they have the double layers? Double glazed. Double glazed glass windows, which is, these are only half a glaze. They're not meant to be a freaking hive at all. But anyway, the girls will actually like to be in the dark, so they'll cover all your glass up. So when you're not watching them, oh, it comes bigger, it's quite warm there. It's crazy shit, the way they warm shit up. Anyway, so I'll put this on here, so the girls don't cover up all their glass. And so hopefully we can still see them. But we'll find out in a minute. The great reveal, as I usually say. Hopefully the thing's not cracked. That'll suck. If we, the other day I had my mum out here. I thought I'd be all clever. And show her this hive. And I hadn't got this window quite right. So when I took the covers off, the girls were all running out the top. <laughs> so that was a bit exciting. Just before my mum's brave. Ta -da! Oh, look at them all packed in there. How cool is that? That's very groovy. Right, there we go. The great reveal. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. <laughs> Her Majesty must be in here somewhere because you can see the new little larvae and eggs down in here. Now, this is the cat brood here. I remember watching this dude when I first started thinking about beekeeping. There's this guy on there and he's talking about splitting hives and he's going on and he's sort of talking about here's some eggs and here's some larvae and here's some cat brood. And I only thought he was saying cat brood. And I'm going, what the bloody hell is a cat brood? <laughs> Why would it be called that? That's a bit odd. So for all you dudes out there that don't know what the fuck I'm saying, it's a, it's a worldwide problem, <laughs> this whole accent deal. Anyway, he was saying cat brood so there you go <laughs> the proper english words well god nobody talks proper english anymore do they someone else made a comment about um substitute feeding in the winter or um in the dwarf it was a dwarf or dwarf well, anyway when there's no fucking flowers whatever that's called um oh, i did think of that i just didn't actually have it in the footage because that happened if you remember when the window broke and the lad buggered off and I was left to my own devices and I put the mesh in. I forgot to show you that part about the feeding bit. So I will get to that right now since it was brought up. And thank you very much. So anyway, I figure, waste not what not, I'll recycle some puddles. Down here in Oz, these things are worth 10 cents to throw though. So that's, you know, shit. That's pretty good. Look, if sold in South Australia, worth 10 cents, it says here somewhere. They used to only be worth 5 cents, but now they're worth 10 cents. So pretty valuable, really. 10 of them, what's that? 10 of them's a buck. Hell, if you had 10 of them, you could throw that towards the Patreon page, couldn't you? What the hell? Wouldn't even miss it. Anyway, sorry, I digress. This was my plan. If you drill a little hole in the top of the lid, my ladder's a bit wobbly, so if I fall into my hive and break shit, well, um, yeah, you might never see this episode. Oh my goodness, that's not fall over. So I haven't done it, but I'll drill a little hole in there, and then I've got a big enough hole for it to sit in, up the top here, somewhere. Where did I put it? There, sorry. <laughs> and it can sit there, and hopefully the lasses can go up and drink it off the top. I might have to put a little mat on the top here somewhere, but I haven't got that far yet. But in theory, they should be able to come up and just drink a little bit, and away we go. You know this being a famous beekeeping business is getting really complicated, because I was out at the Father's Day luncheon here the other day, which was kind of nice, the kids took me out. Well, hang on, did you take me out? I had to buy my own lunch. Yeah, back that shit up. Anyway, they gave me a nice present, so it doesn't matter. Oh, I won't be too bloody mean. Um, anyway, they were asking me about beekeeping. As they, as they do. I go out, and the next thing you know, I'm supposed to know about beekeeping, so which is which I do, so which is kind of cool. And they were asking me about how the bees actually get the nectar out of the flower. 
And I thought, well, this is a bit complicated to explain. But anyway, so I went through the process and said that bees have got a little tongue, which is a long tongue about, well, this is relative to the bee size, <laughs> a reasonably long tongue. If you look at, there's some bees drinking some syrup, that's their tongue that they stick in. Anyway, they stick that in the nectar part of the flower and they get the nectar and they bring it back to the hive and then they share it amongst themselves until it dehydrates a bit. And then they put it in a cell and then they fan it and then it turns into honey. And it was interesting because they, most people think that the bees actually just bring the honey in off the plant. But the honey is actually created in here. So they're, they're actually only bringing nectar, which is the sweet part of the flower. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting, people thought that the pollen on their legs was what they turned into honey. That somehow or other they munched that up. But the pollen is actually a bit like our meat and potatoes. And the nectar is a little bit like Coca-Cola. Or, might be wearing a lot bit better, but a bit, you know, like, so we've got carbohydrates and we've got proteins. So anybody out there who's a proper bloody food person <laughs> would know what that's about. So nectar is the carbohydrates, pollen is the, is the proteins, and then they eat both of them. Most of that stuff is all given to the babies so they can make new bees, which is fairly cool, but anyway. So they do a lot of work just to bring up the next generation, which is not much different to all of us. I think every kid costs a million bucks these days or something, isn't it? I don't know. You could research that. Help me, help me. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Margaret, Margaret, I'm stuck. Come get me. Bloody hell, there's just not quite enough room. Push, push. You can do it. You can do it. Oh, nearly, nearly. Up, up, up. No, it's not going to happen. Bloody hell, this glass is slippery. So the other question that seems to come up very often in public gatherings is how do the bees get made, I suppose, or get born, or get new bees? And the other question is how long do the bloody bees live, which is a bit sad, they don't live that long, they're only about six or eight weeks during summer when they're working their asses off. Anyway, they're very much like every other insect. They start off as an egg, which is obviously what the queen lays in one of these cool little chambers. She lays an egg. And then the nurse bees come along and give her give the egg some royal jelly for about three days. And then they start changing that to something else until the larvae starts to form. And then once the larvae's formed and got to a certain size, and, and I think that's about 16 days or something, but I'm probably wrong because we'll, I, just should, I should get my book out so I can read that exact timings. But anyway, the larvae forms to, a certain, to the age that it wants to. And then the girls know that that's happened. And so they put a, a special cap on top of the honeycomb and then the larvae spins a little poop, little nest, a little, what the fuck is that called, a pupae, a pupa? No? Same thing as a caterpillar does. When they, when they, you know, you see the caterpillars on the branch and they form a little silk nest and then they turn into a moth when they hatch out. But obviously the bees aren't going to turn into a moth because that'd be weird. Anyway, so they do their thing and then they eventually they come and they hatch out and they dig out of the comb and then they become nurse bees themselves. So it's pretty cool. And then they go through the process from a nurse bee to a worker bee to a field bee to a bloody dead bee. <laughs> I guess the other question that I always get is how do they make wax? Because a lot of people think that they actually bring the wax from outside. I don't know whether, you know, whipping around a candle and grab a bit, but that's not what happens. <laughs> The girls, the girls actually have a little secretion gland just under their, on their front, which is where the wax flakes form. And then they roll it into little balls and hand it between themselves and thicken it up. And that's how they make their wax themselves. So you can see a bit of wax getting made here that they've done because they're slightly too much, not quite a, that's a little bit too much bee space. So they're filling it in. That's a bit like my reference to Bob, Bob Roth, wasn't it? They, they're doing their own little artistries. <laughs> but anyway, so they make the wax themselves. The interesting thing about the wax is, though, it's about the only thing they don't recycle. Because they'll, they'll nick off with the pollen, they'll nick off with honey, but when they raid a nest, they leave all that there. They don't actually take, they don't dismantle it. You know, like, I mean, if you're a... <laughs> bit like when the bloody... I guess when a city gets raided and overrun back in the Dark Ages, they left a bit of the city there, didn't they? <laughs> so, so at least they had something to live in. That would be a bit bloody dopey, wouldn't it?
time waster sitting here watching this, isn't it? It's kind of groovy. It's even got me fascinated, even though I've seen a lot of bees. I like the fact that you've got dark ones and light ones and you can see the process going on. And of course, we've had a lot of people that want to be able to sit here 24 hours a day and watch this stuff and do... But it's a little bit complicated to set up a live stream for the audience because um, the girls, as I said at the start of this, they kind of want to be covered up. Otherwise, they'll cover themselves up or they'll get a chill. What we're hoping to do is actually set up a camera and capture some really cool shit like the queen laying an egg, um, the girls feeding the larvae, the girls making nectar into honey, the girls are... Um, capping the brood off, and a little lady being born, that'd be kind of cool. Birth's always cool, everybody likes a birth. A little bit messy sometimes, but anyway, bees aren't got blood and shit going everywhere, so it's quite cool. Um, so we thought we might do that for a start, and thank you all to our Patreon supporters, because we actually got excited and bought ourselves a GoPro with your money, so you can be very thankful to all the supporters out there that have put some money up, so if you are enjoying watching the bees get born, Think about heading over to the Patreon page and kicking in a dollar or two.